about uh, long live IPv4. It's one of those uh, rats that just will not die. Um, I think we've been trying to get rid of it for like two decades, if I'm not mistaken. And here we are, it's still around. Okay, so officially IANA ran out of IPv4 space. They allocate in slash eight blocks. So they originally had, what, 256 of these to hand out, minus a few reserve blocks. 2011, officially the internet ran out of IPv4 space, but the RIR still had some space left. Who can tell me who the first RIR was to run out of space not long after that? I believe, yes, APNIC, that would be them. China and Australia and I think a portion of Russia or something. Okay. Who can We hit soft landing earlier this year, which means we had exactly one slash eight left. As of the statistics last night, we, Afrinic has about 3.7 million addresses left, which is about a slash 10. Okay, that's, well, slash 10 is just over 4 million. <sighs> okay, that's dead, that's gone. So there's basically a few issues with regards to Africa specifically. Afrinic is having issues getting a policy signed whereby we can transfer IPv4 resources. We can't transfer in, we can't transfer out. Um, pretty much north of South Africa, the argument is we must be allowed to transfer in from other regions and South Africa and a few others that's not actually from the region arguing, listen, the policy needs to be bi-directional, otherwise the other guys can refuse to make the transfer, so you have to allow outbound in order to get inbound transfers, and this thing is stalling. By the looks of it, I don't think a policy is going to get passed in the next few years. Um, I suspect by, well, sometime next year, we will be out of that little three million addresses that we have left. Soft landing means at least, well, there's universities being represented here. If they were to go to Afrinic right now, they'd be lucky to get a slash 22, whereas most universities had a slash 16 given to them a few years back. IPv6, okay. Is there anybody here that does not know how IPv6 is structured in terms of addresses onto a LAN? Okay, so IPv6 addresses, they say, is 128 bits. That is basically four split into a slash 64 for every LAN, which means every, you can take every computer on the face of the earth right now and you can put all of them into a single LAN and they'll all still have unique addresses. Um, and then we have that many number of prefixes. So essentially every LAN is a slash 64. That's the way it works. You can change that but you're going to probably break a few things. So unless you have a specific reason to, like you're running a point-to-point -point link and you really need a slash 127 for that, which is the recommended way of doing it, um, you're going to be using a slash 64. So you're going to be using a block of 18 times 10 to the 18 IP addresses for each and every single LAN that you've got. Your ISP is likely going to, when you connect dynamically, delegate a slash 56 or more likely a slash 48 to you. Okay, so you connect via triple P, that gives you 65,000 LANs that you can run behind your router. As a micro ISP, <laughs> you basically get issued with a slash 32 when you become an Afrinic member. That is 4.3 billion prefixes which you can run, which is equivalent to the entire IPv4 space that we had originally including reserved addresses and all of those. So IPv6 has a lot of space. Um, there's some schemes and stuff which I was reading up on last night and over the weekend 
that was proposed to action the migration, some of those schemes are actually so terrible they would have depleted the IPv6 space in a few years. So there were some terrible ideas floating around. As an LIR, if you're a new entrant currently, um, before soft landing, you'd get a slash 22. That's a thousand odd public IP addresses. It's really difficult to run an ISP off of a thousand IP addresses. Okay, so large scale NAT, NAT, all of those things, it's just highly, highly problematic. Can I connect from IPv4 to v6? No. Okay, I've got no way to address it. The other way around is actually technically possible. So if my host has an IPv6 address, technically I can connect to a v4 address by connecting to a special slash 96 subnet, which is predefined. Uh, if, 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 if colon colon slash 96, and then slap on the IPv4 address. So technically I can, and at the gateway that bridges that from v6 to v4, which is called the NAT64 gateway, um, some kind of NAT will then be happening at that point. So the idea is basically that you take that thousand IP addresses, you assign it to a NAT64 gateway, it dynamically uses that 1024 IP addresses and maps your IPv6 space onto that for IPv4 and as an ISP I can now just hand out v6 to my customers. Unfortunately it's not that simple. But anyway, the point being we've got space there, yeah, this is gone. Uh, it's not going to be coming back. We need to make another plan. You're not going to get additional IPv4 space, so if you're running a large network and you need address space you're either going to be buying v4 space, which is really, really expensive. Um, it's not going to be happening. IPv4, I think we said it's one of those rats that just does not want to be go and die. Um, there's a bunch of printers out there. There's a bunch of embedded devices. These things just don't support IPv6. I actually heard earlier today, I think it was no, someone from UJ that I spoke with. Um, there's actually embedded devices now that only supports IPv6. So they have the problem currently where they need to deploy these devices, but the network admins are, mm, we don't want to deploy v6 just yet. So they're kind of stuck. Um, that's almost a bigger problem than the other way around. Um, yeah, NAT for security. That's like security by up. up obfuscation, yeah, security by obscurity. Um, that's exactly what NAT does. It creates obscurity and it's actually no security at all. Um, you can just plonk down a firewall that would actually generate more security because believe it or not, under some circumstances, I can reverse traverse your NAT. If you're connecting out and I know some certain things about that NAT, you can push traffic back at the network. It's not as easy, but and it's very restricted, but it can be done. Um, most hacks happen via email and stuff anyway, or bogus websites and stuff anyway. So that argument is dead. Uh, fear of the unknown. Okay, we had an example here, and I mean, what I told now about IPv6 is really, really high level. Um, the routing and stuff works a little bit differently. The way addresses get assigned and delegated and stuff is a little bit different from IPv4, and yet there are mappings about it and how it works. The fact is, people don't know it, and people have a fear of what they don't know. So that's probably one of the bigger constraints. Ignorance. People don't realize that IPv4 is busy dying. It's like a cancer. It can take a week. It can take 100 years. It just really depends on how and when. We don't know when the shit is going to hit the fan. Um, there's estimates, there's this, that. We are keeping this beast alive. Um, so I've been thinking about a lot of this as well on IPv4. Why are we keeping it around? And again, people love making money. So as long as we're not moving to IPv6, there's now a market for a scarce resource in the form of IPv4. 
And believe it or not, a single IP address retails for roughly 40 US dollars. So that single slash 24, which is a thousand odd addresses, is roughly $40,000 if you need to go buy it right now for transfer. Imagine the guys that have a million odd. Okay, it's these guys that have slash tens. That's 16 million odd addresses. Well, 4 million, sorry. Um, $40, that's $160 million that they're sitting on right there. Why would they want IPv6 to go? Um, they don't. They want to milk this as long as they can and they want to sell those V4 addresses potentially. So lots of money to be made from IPv4 in terms of markets and selling and shoveling this, these things. That price is going to go up. Um, as with any scarce resource, the scarcer it gets, the more people want it, the higher the price goes. Um, believe it or not, we found routers still in the last year that don't support V6 in any form. Many of the routers that you get currently that do support it doesn't have adequate support that ISPs can actually roll these things out. And the guys that write the firmware on these things just go like, you can dual stack. <laughs> yeah, up to a point, um, we kind of need the <laughs> V4 addresses for other purposes. So we have a problem as an ISP. We need to make alternative plans. IPv4, it's probably going to be dead, at least in terms of backhaul and these things. It's unlikely that IPv4 will go away completely. Um, the reason we say this is there's still many devices out there that has technical use that's only capable of V4. Um, some embedded devices, which there's no replacements for. Um, I mean, I think all of you are aware of or have run into a device that is not V6 capable. Okay, so we need some way of making those things work at least for the next 10 years, probably for the next lifetime. Um, yeah. I think everybody's familiar with the private IP address ranges, 192, 168, those things. They defined in RFC 1918. And then the carriers came and said, listen, um, we're out of IP address space. We need to NAT. And they've used the same addresses and they bumped into conflicts. And uh, slash 10 was delegate or repurposed 100.64.0.0 slash 10. And now the carriers have well, 4 million odd IP addresses which they can use on their networks to implement that and we make IPv4 live longer. Um, Go okay, mentioned there, multi-layer, large-scale NAT. So now our customers are running NAT. They don't know how to do routing. They have NAT inside, inside, and we have multiple layers of these things and at each NAT layer, things break. Voice being the most annoying one of those. Um, IPv4 only websites, and I'll get to that a bit later. Interexcel is actually making decent progress on most of that. We've uh, had a bit of a stall the last year or two. And IPv4 only networks. So hosting providers can't get rid of IPv4 until IPv4 is dead. Home users have no motivation to get their ISPs to provide IPv6 until the hosting providers stop providing IPv4. So we have this issue where it's a back and forth tug of war. Reasons why. I think the biggest reason why we haven't moved yet is IPv4 just still works. Okay. It's a hindrance. As long as it stays working and we will keep it working until we've moved to v6. Uh, this problem isn't going to go away. And I mentioned the content provider thing. Um, until a Facebook or a Google or a Netflix or a seriously big provider says enough is enough and switches off v4 connectivity, I don't think IPv4 is going to go away and the ISPs are not going to have the motivation that they need to deploy v6. Um, it's a massive problem. Uh, the content providers probably won't do that. They really need eyeballs to make money. And uh, whilst people want content that said providers are providing, they can't switch it off because they're going to lose their revenue. So it's a problem. Um, that statement is a tough one. IPv4, I think most people have their heads kind of wrapped around it. It's one of those things when I really start Speaking with people, I realized there's 
an understanding of IPv4, how subnetting works and stuff up to a certain point. So people will generally get what the subnet is and what a default route is. How routing on the internet actually works, there's a lot fewer people that really, really get that. IPv6 makes that both easier and harder. Uh, it's just different and you now need to wrap your head around a different set of things that are happening. Um, that statement was true probably until around about 2008 to 2010. Um, there's this section on the internet they call the default free zone where there are no default routes. Um, and portions of that never routed V6. That has been resolved in the meantime and V6 now fully routes. So at that point you'd have IPv6 being routed inside IPv4 packets and things like 6RD and so forth was used to, to an extent, make IPv6 work. Fortunately that's gone. Um, no monetary incentive. Um, yeah. Uh, why would I move to IPv6 if I need to spend money on it and IPv4 is still working? It's a very simple question and very few people can actually answer this. Um, and the reason it there's no reason. Because you want to be a responsible netizen. That's a good reason, but somebody that counts the numbers and says, listen, we're going to invest money in this, looks at how much money are we going to make out of it. And I can't make money out of IPv6 by saying, hey, I'm an ISP that deployed V6. My grandma's going to go, what the hell's IPv6? She doesn't care. As long as she can view her pictures on Facebook and get pictures of the grandchildren, she's happy. So. Yeah, pretty much. As long as the, she can get to those, she doesn't care. She doesn't know what IPv6 is. Hell, she doesn't even know what IPv4 is. So why does it matter? So at the end of the day, the people counting the dollar signs just go like, well, stuff works. Why do, we, why do I want to invest in this? And longevity, as Edwin said, responsible netizen. So uh, it's not as easy. Um, there we go. Okay, so at the end of the day, what's going to drive us to switch is probably the scarcity of IPv4. It's probably going to be the smaller ISPs that can't get hold of IPv4 space and really can't afford to spend millions and millions of dollars on V4 space that is going to be driving this migration. Um, that's the way of life. Those that don't have need to make a plan and they kind of push those that have in a direction that they need them to go. Um, so there's a few strategies with regards to V4 and V6. You can be one of those that just sit back and wait and see what happens. Um, please don't be one of those. Uh, it's probably a valid strategy for many people. Um, and as a home Some user... Of that's more expensive than, than the cost of deploying IPv6, right? <sighs> yes, once your content provider switch off V4, you are going to be buggered because your customers are going to be well, when I'm on Interex Sales connection, I can get to Facebook, YouTube, Google, whatever. When I'm on your connection, I can't. So, cheers, I'm leaving. Um, and it's at that point where the larger guys that currently don't deploy it and see no reason to will actually start deploying it. Or they will go to the content providers and say, listen, really, please switch back IPv4. Hopefully not. Uh, hopefully they'll just say enough is enough. Um, we can dual stack, which is what we are currently doing. So you basically run two networks on the same layer two. Um, so you have two different routing tables, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6, and everything kind of just works. Uh, you're still spending your IPv4 addresses on network routing and all of that. So that slash 22 that you have, you're using a large portion of that for backhaul and not for customers. It's tricky, so we, ideally we really want to spend that entire slash 22 on customers, be it hosting or consumers at the border accessing content. We don't want to be using IPv4 inside the network, so that brings on the next options. 
tunnels, there were a few of these, six in four. They are dead. Uh, they no longer required, so unless your ISP only supports IPv4 and you really, really, really want IPv6, you're not going to be doing that. Um, so currently home users might still do that simply because they're one of those hobbyists, whatever. More likely they're just going to find an ISP that supports IPv6. They are in the far minority of people. The Rideau 164 over UDP. Uh, I'm not sure who came up with that, but basically if you just slap an IP packet inside an IP packet, most routers will just go like, okay, we don't have UDP or TCP. So we're going to treat this like we treat GRE. We're going to take the protocol number. We've seen that from internal IP address X. Whatever comes back with the same protocol number, we're going to send back to X. Um, so if anybody's ever wondered why you can only dial one uh, PPTP connection over entry-level routers, that's the reason. They don't discriminate on the GRE endpoint identifiers. They just look at the protocol number and whoever was the guy that last dialed and sent GRE traffic, all of the GRE traffic is going back there. Um, same thing happened with 16.4. in so they set up the Rido that has well-defined port numbers and UDP and suddenly you could tunnel IPv6 over IPv4 from behind NAT. NAT again. Okay, 6RD, um, basically IPv6 rapid deployment. In basic principles, if we had to run IPv6 off of that and just to deploy that, we would have used the slash 16 of the IPv6 space gone just for that. Uh, 4RD, a scheme to run IPv4 inside IPv6 for customers. Uh, I think this, these two, as far as I could determine, only one French ISP ever used either of those publicly. Um, nobody else seems to have deployed it. And there's probably a bunch of others I couldn't find that people proposed. Um, yeah. The one that is much more interesting is address family translation. So effectively, what if we could make IPv4 and IPv6 interoperable? In other words, when you're on IPv4, we could make it connect to IPv6 and the other way around. Um, so as it turns out, to an extent we can, uh, there's something called SSIT, stateless IP and ICMP translation, which can do a lot of that. The number of routers and stuff that actually supports this though, very, very few. So what the ISPs are proposing to an extent we do, uh, since the NAT64 devices exist and we can actually write software to do that quite easily. Um, as I've mentioned before, there's a colon uh, FFFF colon colon slash 96. But if you advertise that on your network, endpoint devices will actually connect or send IPv4 traffic to that when it's run running IPv6 only, and you can at that point do the tunnel, so that's NAT64. And then they've invented this thing called DNS64. So if you're using your ISP's DNS servers and you're requesting quad A records, they will then request it from wherever. They'll get an NX, uh, or NX domain says the record doesn't exist in any form. So if they get an empty response, they will requery for an A record and they will fake a quad A record pointing at that address, which will then route there, and they can then NAT. So now they only need to deploy IPv6 to you. However, not all devices support IPv6, and some people came up with a scheme called 464XLAT. So what that does is, at your border, uh, out of your, your end consumer, I can assign whatever IPv4 range I want to. Um, RFC 18, 19, 1918 addresses, perfectly fine, not an issue, LSN, doesn't matter. I can now give you a slash 24. You run that in whatever comes out of it will get translated to an IPv6 address, slash 96 that's assigned on the router. It'll basically denat the destination address to that FF range. That'll route to the NAT64 gateway and it'll denat back to IPv4. So you've got IPv4 on the one end, then IPv6 on your core network, and then IPv4 again. Now I can get rid of IPv4 on my core network completely, and I basically provide you IPv4 as a service, as they say. 
which is really, really cool. So that's a sensible workable strategy that can work, but DNSSEC, which is being pushed by some of the larger guys at the moment, breaks with that. Currently, you can lose about 1% of your customer base if you've got DNSSEC deployed and they're coming from an ISP that is using DNS 64. So it's reasonably insignificant. Most of the guys that need this just say, stuff it. We're just going to push ahead and do it. 464 XLAT doesn't suffer that problem, so I'm partial to that. Um, I kind of like that. Tunnels, I think we all agree. <laughs> it just gets really, really messy. Um, the overhead on these things can get quite nasty. Um, routing gets to be very, very suboptimal. Um, yeah. Okay, DNS 64, this is a workable solution. So I need to reiterate this. It's not that I'm completely against this, this will work, but I just don't think it's ideal. It requires all endpoints to control IPv6 only. Um, in other words, devices that only supports IPv4 are dead in the water. So that's a bit of a problem and DNS 64 breaks DNS sec uh, according to the statistics that we've got, which Yeah, statistics, um, yeah. <laughs> Let's just say we don't really know how big the impact will be. The estimation is that it'll be relatively insignificant. Um, apparently DNSSEC mostly gets checked by ISP. Uh, DNS service currently, Windows for example, apparently doesn't do any kind of DNSSEC checking as a client. So most people use that, so we suspect it won't be a major issue. Motivation for 464 XLAT. So I really do like this. Only need to run IP, uh, need, uh, sorry. No need to run IPv4 on core backhaul network. So my customer edge, the CE device needs to understand how to NAT from version four to version six. And I need, at my core to my, to the rest of the internet, I need to understand how to NAT again from version six to version four. Inside that and in between that, I don't need any IP version four which simplifies my core backhaul network a lot. Um, only need minimal IPv4 network on edges facing other providers. So where I get my transit and stuff, <coughs> there I need a minimalistic IPv4 deployment, literally one or two LANs, that's it. Um, so I just need to basically be able to get IPv4 off my network and back onto it, that's it. I can allocate any IPv4 range to my customers, um, doesn't matter as long as what I'm using for the NAT64 is public addressing, it'll work. Um, eventually that'll stop working. Content providers are blacklisting IP addresses when they detect certain things. So if you have too many customers behind the same IPv4 address, massive problems. Um, I don't need massive infrastructure to maintain NAT64. Uh, there's guys that's running literally two or three hosts that's doing hundreds of thousands of connections. So it's not, ex it's relatively state, well, state full on the six to four side, it's stateless on the four to six side. So since there's a one-to-one -one mapping, I don't need to maintain any kind of state there. It kind of just works. Um, I think that's, yeah. So there's ways to also, the content providers can do really cool stuff with that as well. So if they've got IPv4 addresses, they can actually denat that on ingress to their IPv6 internal network. And I believe Facebook is already doing that. Um, so if you're connecting to Facebook over IPv4, you're actually getting a degraded service compared to someone that's natively connecting on V6. Why, as an ISP or a network, you should start now, and as a customer, you should push those entities to kind of move if possible, if you have any kind of influence. V4 addresses, I mentioned earlier, $40 per address. Okay, single slash 24 is $10,000. If you just do that calculation very quickly. $10,000 is about 150,000 Rand. I'm not sure anybody wants to be spending that kind of money to get IPv4 connectivity. Um, probably there are, maybe they think it's cheaper than just rolling out V6. Maybe they're right. Um, AfriNIC is the only RIR still with IPv4 resources that they can hand out. About 4 million IP addresses, actually just under. 
and we can't transfer from other RIRs. So um, one of them has got a lot of unused space sitting with current providers, uh, or LIRs as they call them. We can't transfer that to us, um, simply because Afrinic is being stuck up, and I'll say that quite trivially. Um, IPv6, if you're an ISP running short on v4 addresses, it can actually help you to slow down your consumption of whatever IPv4 space you've got left. Um, so if you're using 464 XLAT, the really cool thing of that is you'd no longer need IPv4s on the route to your customer, so you need fewer addresses per customer. Um, this one I really like. Um, I think we all love to hate SIP ALG, for those of you that don't know what I'm referring to, be thankful. Um, GRE issues, um, no NAT implies none of that crap. Endpoints are connectable, so as long as your firewall is sensibly set up, you have both security and functionality. Um, although setting up firewalls to be secure in that environment is a different, different problem. Um, once you start deploying 464 XLAT, you can probably start recovering IPv4 space on your backhaul network, which means you can make IPv4 live even longer um, without breaking things really, really badly. Um, so my opinion is the sooner you start, the better. Um, where is a company we are at? We've dual stacked everywhere where we can. There's one spoke the, out of our network where we haven't yet deployed V6, nor can we. We are busy negotiating with the provider that is preventing this from happening, and they have indicated that they are willing to finally, after I think almost 10 years of arguing with them, to come to the table. Um, I may not mention names. I could land in serious trouble for that one. Working towards IPv6 enabling all services. Um, so earlier in the year, we got DNS, NTP. We actually looked over NTP, so that only happened about three or four months back. Um, so that's all IPv6 now in our network, except if you're an IPv4 only customer. Um, even if you're IPv4 only, your query to us may be IPv4, but going out to the rest of the world, if we can get to it via IPv6, we do. Um, routing demons, all of that, everything is V6 currently wherever possible. Email, everything is currently being transmitted and received mostly via IPv6, which is really cool. Web is, well, all of the back-end work is done. Uh, we're just busy doing the last testing. Issues there we had were with regards to high availability. Um, so floating IP addresses didn't quite want to float the way we wanted them to. We've now solved that and hopefully in the next month or two we will be publishing Quad A records for most of our customers hosting stuff with us. Voice, um, yeah, that gets to be an interesting mess. Um, so as it turns out, ChanSIP and PJSIP works fundamentally different. I need to bind to specific IP addresses for the way we are deploying voice. And the way RTP address selection then works breaks for us for PJSIP. So V6 works for ChanSIP to an extent, but the where it does work, we have other constraints that stops us from using that. So voice currently IPv4 only, we are working to change that. Some of the fixes that I now need to that well, that we need to implement with respect to WebRTC will actually enable us to deploy um, IPv6 on our hosted PABX systems. For those that wonder about that, we are deploying IP address per voice customer. We've got up to about 200 IP addresses per physical host. So if you're selecting the wrong address from that pool for RTP, um, the host behind NAT will send traffic to one address and the response will come from a different one and NAT traversal very inconveniently breaks and uh, the V6 side has a similar issue so if the firewalling isn't set up to allow from the slash 64 range RTP also will not traverse. Um, that is in process of being fixed. 
Okay, other things like radius, ongoing battles, sign provider. Um, so most of that is currently still IP version 4. Um, again, we need to bind to a specific address. So as long as that one provider is not willing to move us to IP version 6, all of our radius has to remain IP version 4. Other than that, entire hosted environment v6 as far as possible already. Um, yeah, I mentioned again, we're pushing the last of the providers to enable IPv6 on the last mile. Hopefully that'll happen sometime this year still. I'm not holding my breath. Okay. At that point, we will likely need to start looking at deploying NAT64. We've got the software. There's a, it's called Joule SS, SIIT. They are pushing to get the kernel modules in upstream kernel. And then it's just some software required to configure that. So once that is done, we should have that working nicely. Um, once we've got that, we can start working on deploying NAT 44 to 6 sometime next year as well. Um, there's a big problem there though. If anybody knows of any consumer grade devices that actually support NAT 4 to 6, please come and speak to me afterwards. I would really love to know what that hardware is. Uh, Mikrotik, which is one of the more commonly available setups, does not support NAT4-6, which means we can't deploy IPv6 on most of our... Well, we can't deploy 464x LAT on most of our links currently because we've got Mikrotik pretty much everywhere. Um, I think Cisco has some support for it, but Cisco CPE devices gets relatively expensive. Um, yeah, once we've managed to do that, we can start working on recovering some IPv4 space and hopefully we'll be able to reutilize. We've got a slash 21 in addition to a slash 22. We will be able to utilize more of that for services where we actually need it. Um, currently, a lot of our IPv4 space is dead, but we can't reclaim it either. And that is where we are at. Um, if you've got any questions, suggestions, or discussions, or any additional information, now is the time. Why do the Phoenix and those just not let the IPv4 go? Because they still have some space and there's monetary advantage intercompany and the policy makers are, it's not necessarily the entity providing the resources. So there's policy being driven by the members um, who has vested interest in keeping IPv4 alive because at $40 an IP address, there is definitely monetary value for them. They set the policies by which the likes of Afrinic, Erin and so forth have to abide. So unfortunately, it's a political issue more than a tech conflict of interest. Yeah. Why not only hand out ones that support IPv6? Speak to the vendor which we have been alluding to, to push their hardware vendor, uh, whose name I shall rather not mention, and uh, then maybe we will get more prevalence on devices that do support it. So basically, again, uh, they've got vested interest in keeping IPv4 alive. How are you going to do that if your ISP don't support IPv6? So I'm just thinking in terms of trying to push it, getting, it, getting everything ready on your side. Maybe you can push your ISP from that. I promise you, your network is IPv6 ready. If you go onto any Linux machine right now after a fresh install and run IPADSH, you will see there is a link local address IPv6 already configured. If you go on your Linux gateway, you will see the same thing. 
Um, so if you've got a Micratic and you've loaded the IPv6 module, it will have IPv6 addresses on each and every interface. Uh, FE something something slash eight, which are the link local addresses on which IPv6 is built. So they are there, your network is V6 already. As soon as a link advertisement comes in, um, your devices will auto-configure IPv6. They will likely still use DHCP um, on version 4 to get DNS, so they will likely still by default push DNS via, via IP version 4. But wherever possible, since both Windows, Linux, all of those pretty much use IPv6 as a preference, um, most of your connections will automatically switch over to V6. Okay, so, so if you look at the header size for IPv6 packet, it's 40 bytes. IPv4 is 20 bytes. So IPv6 packet is literally 20 bytes larger than an IPv4 packet. Um, speed disadvantage, I think we calculated 8 bytes is about half a percent earlier, so 20 over 1,500. Um, that'll give you the percentage slowdown that you're going to be experiencing for V6 over V4. It is probably 1% or so. Um, Given the better congestion control mechanisms and so forth, your overall experience will probably be better. I think Carl, who's not here right now, would actually have some statistics on that. When you say you're struggling to get voice going, why? why what specifically about voice? It's just a packet of data that sits inside the header inside the So the issue that we're having specifically, um, we've got multiple hosts, so we Bind, the last time I reported this and spoke with Digim regarding a problem I was having, they were like, we want this and this output. The guy took one look at it and it's like, in, okay, that's not a supported configuration. We run up to 200 asterisk instances on a single box. So when they ask you for output of PSAXF and there's like <laughs> 1,500 to 2,000 processes running for your voice infrastructure, they go like, so effectively what's happening is you have the host address and then a bunch of extra addresses. So Chan SIP is bound to this address. It'll then use this address for RTP. What PJ SIP does is it will advertise this address in the SDP, but it'll bind to the any address. So when it sends, the, when the host sends from that socket, it'll send from the primary address. On the receive, the remote side will send to this address. That'll punch a hole in NAT, and that'll just work. IPv6 may very well just work for that use case, which is why we've left PJSIP running on port 5060 for that specific use case. We haven't been able to test it since no ISP has rolled out IPv6 all the way to the customer other than us. Um, and the customers where we do have that um, either don't care about voice or they've got their own voice infrastructure internally, which is IPv4 only. So we just haven't had an opportunity to test the V6 side on it. I hate to say it, but um, isn't it phones and IoT devices and potentially the three cloud providers that have the power to force it? Because it's a cost factor and then time to replace. So Correct. You drop your phone quite often, AWS burns through new infrastructure, it improves things. We need something where if the cost is low enough, we need a content provider to say enough is enough. Who drives the standards behind the mobile devices? Is it the consumer or is it the carrier? Most content providers currently, the larger ones are dual stacked uh, or they're using NAT 4 to 6. The cool thing for them is they can do that stateless. So since it's an IPv4 connection coming in, the 
number of address bits required is 32 for each address, and there's 128 available on the NATed site. So if you just encode the IPv4 address into the v6 address, it's a stateless translation. It's just a matter of routing. That's a good question. So Cloudflare is V6 enabled, and they're happy to connect to you either over V4 or V6. In order to take advantage of the CDN, you have to be V6. Will they? Because they're going to be losing customers. At the end of the day, it's all about this. It's just a less impact way for uh, things will still work. But for Cloudflare, is it also survival? Because if a DDoS attack gets to a point where they just don't have any more IPv4 space, the only way to mitigate them is to start spreading it larger. So here's an interesting statement, um, and I've had a discussion with this with some rather big security guys in South Africa very recently. Unless you own half the internet bandwidth, more than half, there's no way to seriously properly mitigate a DDoS. Okay, IPv6 <laughs> makes that worse, not easier. If I were to launch a DDoS on you, I wouldn't target a specific IP address. I would target the prefix. So whatever you're putting in BGP, that's what I'm going to be targeting. Just write the recipe, put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is that recipe can be easily adjusted for V6. <laughs> so <laughs> how bad do you want the problem to be? <laughs> No worse, I mean, no more so than it is today. Um, so currently, if an attacker was to sit on a remote network, uh, they already have multiple layers of NAT behind which they're sitting in all likelihood. So it's already very easy to hide. It's less easy in an IPv6 world. So that's an interesting concept. Um, much harder to hide in an IPv6 world than in an IPv4 world. So IPv4, lots of NAT, uh, your CPE is NATing, so yes, I can pinpoint it to a customer, but even with NAT64, I will have logs at the ISP of who utilized what IP address at what point in time. So no, uh, it's no worse than what we've got today. In fact, it's probably better. <laughs> since the IPv4 addresses inside the network is actually indirectly exposed. So even if it's a slash 24 on the network, um, eight bits of the IPv6 address will be used to encode the host portion. So I'll actually have, be able to provide you more information as to whom inside the network was causing problems. Any other questions? Hendrik? I think this is yay. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay.